Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second webinar of 2022. I should say good morning to everyone listening in North America, good evening to everyone listening out of Asia, and good afternoon from anyone listening from within Europe. My name is Willem Bermanja. I am the Director of Strategic Communication at Forbo Flooring Systems, and I will be your host for the next hour. I will have two speakers. One is Amanda Fischer from UL, who I will introduce a little bit later, and the other one is Edo Rem, Global Marketing Director of Forbo Flooring Systems, a colleague of mine. Now, we're going to talk about how to select truly sustainable flooring. And what we are really going to talk about is data verification. Is what we hear, is what we see actually true? When I was talking about sustainability in the early 20s, some 20 years ago, I often was using this cartoon to start off my presentation, the magic of marketing. I was a marketing director at the time, so I was at liberty to use it, but it is actually true. If you talk about sustainability, if you talk about being green, everything is really possible to say. Who's there to know that this is true? Who's there to know that it, this, is actually this is actually data that are being verified? Actually, we're entering the area of fake news. You might say, ah, this is something of the past. That is not happening today anymore. And I must say, yes, mainly greenwashing is something that was being done in the past. Although you might say it's still being done today, a little bit more subtle. This is an example of a German magazine at the beginning of this year where a carpet manufacturer is actually claiming we recycle every square meter. And when you open the article, a little bit later on in the magazine, yes, again, we recycle every square meter. But when you start reading the article, it's really about the production waste in the factory that's being recycled into the carpet. It's not about installation waste at the consumer building site. It's not about post-consumer waste when the flooring has had its useful uh, period of uh, life. It's actually just what's happening in the factory. To then state, we recycle every square meter, that's a little bit much. Now, we will be talking about things like LCAs, EPDs, PCRs, EPRs. Difficult topics, but to make it a little bit easier for you, I'm going to kick off with a small video that explains exactly what it is that we are going to speak about. Choices are being made every day, but what are the right sustainable choices when it comes to deciding which type of floor covering to use? Let's say you run a new construction project or renovation. With the right choices, you can make a difference in the environmental footprint of your building, reduce your CO2 footprint, control your waste, recycle, reuse, and rethink your materials. With an environmental product declaration for the materials that you use, you can make the right choice. But what helps you to decide whether a product is sustainable or not? With environmental product declarations. EPD is an environmental product declaration based on a product life cycle assessment, LCA. It's a disclosure tool that helps clarify a product's sustainable qualities and environmental impacts, from the cradle to the grave. This way, you make better decisions on which products to use or not. To set a market-wide standard, this EPD is accredited by a program operator according to ISO 14025 and EN 15804 and is independently verified by a third party. This is what makes our flooring unique. We offer EPDs for almost any of our floor covering products. An EPD provides information on seven environmental impact categories, for example, CO2 footprint, and raw materials used in the product and their origin. The amount of bio-based and re-upcycled or circular used materials. Declaration on the amount and type of energy use. And Fulbo even provides the impact on human health and ecotoxicity. Furthermore, you'll find info around production processes, product construction, technical product properties, CE-related certifications, fire and safety certifications, and so on. And did you know our Malmaleum sheet is produced CO2 neutral and EPD proven? In case you want more info about EPD, visit our Forbo Flooring Systems or the UL site. 
Don't forget that in the LEED Green Building Rating System, products with an EPD can contribute to a maximum of two additional points depending on the product selected. And when applying for BREAM 2018 Building Certification, one must use products with an EPD only. So whether you're an installer or architect, a building owner or an architectural consultant, the EPD data is the information that you need. It's transparent, easy to understand and perfect for building various green certification programs. This way, we create a better environment together. Fighting global warming every day, choice after choice. So, what choices did you make today? Okay, I hope that that provided a more simpler explanation of what it is that we are going to talk about. I'm now joined by Amanda Fischer, who is speaking to us live from the Chicago area in North America. Amanda is a business development manager on product sustainability and working with UL. Now, UL is a global leader in PCR creation and EPD certification. They write... Our transparency summarizes, summaries provide an e easily digest, digestible overview of the EPD. This helps uh, enable buyers and building specifications and purchasing organizations to quickly review the content and utilize it in their projects. Your EPD report from UL has been thoroughly investigated and ver verified to meet our scientific data. That's what you do, Amanda. You check whatever it is that we claim and say. Is that so? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> nice to have you here, Amanda. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, you're going to talk about UL. You're going to talk about your work. You have a presentation. Could you please share that with us? Please, the floor is yours. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about environmental product declaration certification and specifically the program operator's role in that process. As uh, I, I know I got a very kind, warm introduction, I'll give a little bit more about myself here. So uh, I am business development manager for UL's product sustainability team. I have 18 years of experience in the product certification industry. And uh, a, a portion of that time was spent in the water and plumbing space. So that's certifying products for things like Right now, um, I'm working in the climate team at UL. And so specifically, I'm working on life cycle assessment based services like product carbon footprinting and environmental product declarations. Um, I have a bachelor's of science and degree in chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And I do reside in the Chicago area. I work out of UL's Northbrook office, which is our... our Okay, so I have some key terms here that I think our video covered pretty well. Um, so I'm not gonna go into them in too much detail. The life cycle assessment, PCRs and EPDs are terms that I think you guys have already been introduced to a little bit from the video. Uh, I wanted to talk about ISO because that's something I'm gonna dig into a little bit further on the next slide. So ISO is the International Organization for Standardization. They create a number of standards and publish those standards. They have the ISO 14020 series of standards that are designed to assist businesses with measuring and communicating their efforts to minimize environmental impacts, okay? So keeping that in mind, I wanted to talk a little bit more about environmental labeling. So environmental labeling allows for companies to share the environmental aspects of their products. And I thought this fact up in the upper right-hand corner was pretty powerful. More than 60% of architects and designers are looking for hard scientific data on products specified in their projects, as well as effective tools to compare the sustainability performance that underpins credible certification. I think this really drives home the importance of environmental labeling to specifiers. So a little bit more about environmental labeling. There's mandatory labeling and there's voluntary labeling. Mandatory labeling includes things like information disclosures and, and hazard warnings. I think a good example, at least from, from the U.S. perspective, is, is FIFRA, which has mandatory pesticide labeling. On the other hand, we have voluntary labeling. Okay? And, and voluntary labeling is really standardized by those ISO standards. There's three different types of, uh, of 
environmental labeling under the ISO standards, type one, type two, and type three. And in the interest of time, I'm really gonna just focus on, on the type three labels here today, which is what environmental product declarations falls under. Uh, type three eco labels, uh, they're ones that provide quantified environmental data on a product. They are life cycle assessment based and they're verified by a third party like UL um, as, as a program operator, but there's other program operators as well, such as IBU, International EPD, EPD Italy, et cetera, okay? So ISO 14025 is the specific standard that covers type three uh, environmental labeling. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more on this next slide. So this is an overview of the EPD certification process following the requirements of ISO 14025. There's several responsible parties that are involved in this process. One is the company seeking the EPD, typically the manufacturer. One is the LCA practitioner. Uh, sometimes the manufacturers have the capability of, of doing the LCA in-house, but oftentimes an external provider might be used. And then finally, there's the program operator, and that's UL's role. We are a program operator. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about the program operator responsibilities in the next few slides. But let's talk about the certification process at a high level and what that flow looks like. The first step in, in certifying an EPD is determining the correct PCR. Uh, each product needs to fall under a product category rule. If there isn't a PCR for a product, then one needs to be created before you can make an EPD. Okay? You can't make an EPD without having a PCR that covers the specific product for which you're trying to get the EPD. Once the appropriate PCR has been selected, the next step is to conduct the life cycle assessment study, which uses the parameters of that PCR. That's typically done by the LCA practitioner or in-house capabilities by the manufacturer. Once the LCA is complete, the program operator uh, will verify the LCA study. That can be done by the program operator themselves or one of their approved external verifiers. Uh, next is drafting the EPD document. This could be done by the manufacturer or it can be returned to the LCA practitioner to make the draft of the document. And then it goes to the program operator again to verify that EPD document. So once the LCA and the EPD have both been verified and meet all of the criteria, the EPD can be registered and published in, in the EPD database. So for UL, our EPD database is our spot database where you can find all of our EPDs. So you see a number of steps here that are the program operator steps. I'm gonna dive into that a little bit more. As I said, UL is a program operator and I wanted to explain a little bit more what that means and why it's important to the EPD process. So ISO type three declarations require a program operator to oversee the development of the EPD following the ISO requirements. So what does that mean? What, what are our responsibilities? One is that we have to have program instructions. We have to have guidelines that explain how we do our process. We need to revise those documents, those procedures, those guidelines as necessary. So if the ISO requirements are updated, we need to update our program documents accordingly. We need to make sure that all the type three labeling requirements are met. Um, if we are a PCR creator, which UL is, we do write PCRs, we need to have procedures that explain how we establish those PCRs. And then when we create a PCR, we need to publish those PCRs and make them available. Um, we need to make sure that there's, there's procedures that prevent the misuse of our marks and logos so people aren't out there using them and um, in a way that's, that's not illegal or pre pretending they have something that they don't. Um, we also need to make the EPDs publicly available so that any buyer architect, contractor, specifier can find them. Um, we need to make sure that we safeguard the consistency of our program. And then finally, making sure that the verifiers we use are competent, whether that's an in-house verifier or an external verifier, okay? So those are the general program operator responsibilities. And if you remember the flow chart that I had shared on the EPD certification process, the first step was selecting the correct PCR. There's a variety of organizations that publish PCRs. 
typically program operators. A lot of the program operators have their own PCRs. And each of us program operators, we do not need to use our own PCRs. We can use any um, PCR that's out there in order to create an EPD. Um, so your product does need to fall under the scope of a PCR. And if it doesn't fall under the scope of a PCR, then one needs to be created before the EPD process can be can move forward, before the LCA really can be done. Um, what does that process look like? So I've put here a flow chart of what UL's process is. Uh, the PCR is created by a committee. It's not just created by UL. It's an open process that is open to participation from a range of stakeholders. So users, manufacturers, it could be regulators, certifiers, it can be LCA providers. Um, they, they can join the committee and then that committee drafts the PCR. The PCR is then open to public comments and then the committee responds to those comments and revises the PCR as necessary. Finally, an expert panel reviews the PCR um, and updates it if they need to. And, and publishes that PCR. And it, when updates are needed, it follows a very similar process with, with that same committee. So once you have a PCR in place that covers the product for which you're trying to get an EPD, the next step is to create the LCA. Um, the LCA needs to be created according to certain criteria. There's two ISO standards that um, establish how LCAs should be created. That's ISO 14040 and ISO 14044. The LCA also needs to meet the requirements of the applicable PCR. If you have a construction product, there is a core PCR, ISO 21930, that the, uh, the LCA needs to meet as well. For Europe, that would be EN 15804. Um, that's the LCA process. So the LCA is created in accordance with those requirements. And then it comes to us for review. We do our review via a matrix. That verification is done via a matrix of all the criteria and all those standards. So it's quite a complex process where we look at all the criteria and we consider things like, do the products fit the scope of the PCR? Does the LCA follow the system? some boundaries required by the PCR? Does it use data that fits the parameters of the PCR and were the calculations performed correctly? Um, once that review is complete and the LCA is compared against all the required criteria, we'll go back to the client and say, you know, tell them if any updates are needed. And we'll go back and forth until the LCA is updated and meets all of the necessary requirements for verification. Once the LCA is verified, the EPD can be drafted. The EPD is typically drafted by the manufacturer or it may be drafted by the LCA practitioner as well. And once it's drafted, it's gonna come back to the program operator, so UL in our case, for verification. We do that review very similarly with a matrix, it's a spreadsheet. It contains all of the applicable criteria that's required for an EPD. That includes requirements from ISO 14020, which, which covers environmental labels in general, ISO 14025, which we already discussed, which specifically covers environmental product declarations. Um, if it's a construction product and, and uh, falls under the, the core PCR of ISO 21930, it'll need to meet those requirements or perhaps EN 1504 in Europe. Um, of course, the applicable PCR as well. And then finally, our program requirements. As I said, each program operator has their own program requirements and the EPD needs to meet those specific requirements from, from our program or the applicable program operator's program. So as part of that process, if there's any editorial or compliance issues that are discovered, the EPD is returned to the manufacturer and practitioner. And again, it needs to be updated just like the LCA until it complies and it, it meets all of the verification criteria. So once the EPD has been verified and the LCA, they've both been verified and they meet all criteria, the EPD can be certified and we, we register it. So what that looks like is you get an EPD certificate, the EPD certificate goes up into our EPD database and each program operator has their own database. Ours is the UL spot database where all of our environmental um, labels that have been approved are, are up in that database. 
Um, what's great about having that database is it, it's, it's easily accessible by buyers, by contractors, architects, anybody that needs to access that and find your environmental product declaration. And then finally, for marketing purposes, you can use our certification badge to show that your product has been evaluated um, and has an environmental product declaration for it. It references our website so people know where to go, where they can and go and find the EPD. And so that's an overview of the certification process for an EPD and, and specifically UL's part, the program operator piece and what we do as part of that. I just wanna leave with, with one final slide here that really talks about um, the importance of EPDs and the verification process. Uh, I think EPDs really help manufacturers and purchasers, distributors, um, from government to institutions help evaluate a product's characteristics. It really brings awareness of the environmental impacts of a product. And um, it's for really all these reasons that you see on the left-hand side of the slide. So when you have UL or another program operator certify an EPD, it helps ensure consistency in the EPD document. It makes sure that the EPD complies with the applicable requirements and it helps take pressure off of the company that's seeking the EPD by giving them the resources they need to get it done right and protecting their brand by reducing errors, potential errors with the EPD. So I know we're gonna be taking questions at the end of the webinar, but if you have any questions for me after, after this webinar here today, you can reach out to me directly, my email address. Um, and thank you, that's all I had for us today. Okay, thank you very much, Amanda. Um, yes, indeed, there is one question already for you, and it's about PCRs, those product category rules where it all starts with. So the PCR, can, can anyone write a PCR? How is that being done? Yeah, so the PCR, each, the PCR cannot be written just by anybody, right? The PCR is done according to a very formal process. Um, typically done by a program operator, you need to have procedures and guidelines that meet the criteria of the ISO 14025 standard. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as I shared, there's, um, there, it's usually done via a committee. So it needs to be a process that's open to participants from, from all interested parties. It can be manufacturers, uh, regulators, it can be LCA practitioners, anybody that's potentially gonna be using the PCR. Um, will need to provide their input so that the PCR is really fair and, and equal for um, everybody in the industry. Yeah. yeah, so actually like it is within the flooring industry, it's the members of the associations, it's the manufacturers who, to, who together draft the PCR for carpets or for vinyl floor covering or for linoleum. That's how I understand it. Now, you um, as a certifier, you're based in the U.S. Um, your EPDs that you verify, that you qualify, are they valid just in the U.S. or are they valid worldwide? Yeah, so they can be valid you, uh, worldwide. I think it's um, it's it depends on a few things. So the PCRs can be global PCRs or they can be regional PCRs, mm -hmm. and so okay. the EPD is written based upon uh, that PCR. So if you're using a global PCR, then it could be a global EPD, right? Um, another thing to consider with that is that um, there's a variety of different program operators. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that in certain areas, the buyer or the, um, the, the specifier may be familiar with certain databases over other yeah. you know, EPD databases. And so because of that, they may wanna be listed in multiple databases. We do see that sometimes. So a lot of us uh, program operators actually have mutual recognition agreements in place with various international operators yeah. so that we can have those EPDs listed in the different databases. Again, the EPD itself is can be global mm -hmm. um, if, if the global EPD, but um, being in the different databases might expand that reach or make it more easily recognized. Okay, good. Let's now take a look at Forbo, at Forbo Flooring Systems, and let's see how we as Forbo Flooring Systems are actually working with EPDs, LCAs, and how we um, explain the product category rules. For that, I would like to invite Edo Rem, who is Forbo's Global Marketing Director. 
He has been involved heavily in product management um, and has been uh, working with EPDs and working on EPDs for a good part of his working life. Um, Edo, if I can share the screen with you, that would be good. There you are. Um, okay. Edo, I remember that uh, when I joined Forbo about uh, 20 years ago, people said, oh, by the way, do you know that we have an LCA for linoleum? And I had to be explained what an LCA was, Life Cycle Assessment. As early as 1996, we created our first life cycle assessment for linoleum with the Leiden University in the Netherlands. Today, 20 years on, we are a big step forward and a big step ahead. Could you lead us through um, the experience of Forbo in the past years and what it is that we are doing today? Yes, of course, uh, William. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, my, uh, my part is, is making a connection to uh, what Amanda Fischer has just told us about, uh, let's say, the fundament on which everything is based on. Yeah. The, uh, the reflection that you give to the past, uh, Willem, uh, relates very much to the early days when no standards were present. Uh, we all had to invent it, uh, essentially, uh, Correct. ourselves. Um, and luckily, the chosen standards that Forbo started with in '96 actually have become our uh, business-wide uh, PCR to many of our standards today. So we started out well, uh, which is a good foundation indeed to, uh, to proceed with. Um, I'll share my screen indeed to um, yep. also explain uh, slightly the background on, uh, on what, where we are. Okay. But of course, I need to address in my presentation as well, the question that is on the invitation, how to select sustainable flooring, because that's at Correct. the end why we are doing this, uh, this webinar. And, and uh, secondly, why we also believe that uh, LCAs and EPDs are a very strong vehicle to make that happen. First slide is, is, is a very short introduction on Forbo. Um, I don't want to elaborate too much on it. I guess most people are aware of that Forbo is quite an international company with a uh, I would say European base, production base, 15 production sites, 25 different offices across the globe. And uh, as you asked uh, Amanda, uh, indeed, are we uh, covering uh, APDs, LCAs for uh, the world? Yes, we are. And we do it also for the width of our portfolio. Uh, our portfolio is PVC products, vinyl products, uh, marmolium products, textile products, and Flotex products. And uh, uh, within that, uh, let's say, breadth of products, we talk about uh, a few hundred different collections that we carry across the globe. And uh, the reason why we actually today are uh, actively uh, involved in bringing LCA as the, the standard to disclose our information is because of this slide here. Uh, we have been faced, and many of you, I guess, uh, with the statements that uh, uh, people are uh, shouting out, we use green energy and we're certified with cradle to cradle certificates. We uh, produce green products. But of course, how do you then make the differentiation if uh, you do not have a complete context how you should, uh, uh, let's say, read all this? Um, if you do not get the full context, it could be potentially misleading. It could set the wrong examples for others to follow, but it could also uh, make the whole green movement uh, a bit, I would say, discarded, a bit useless. So what we are really want to do, and uh, with linoleum being a big part of our portfolio today, uh, we have a high interest to uh, make sure that sustainability is a big topic uh, in our communication and our marketing forward. Uh, hence, we use life cycle assessment to um, well, uh, enable measurability and transparency. And what that means in reality is that uh, impacting um, the, the measuring from cradle to grave, uh, which in, 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 uh, in fact means that we assess the whole value chain. And this is a short, short lesson on what is LCA exactly. Um, it is an instrument to measure the environmental performance, of course, of a product across its complete life cycle. It measures the contribution of a product uh, in different impact categories, which I will cover in a minute. And um, it's simply a straightforward product comparison methodology. And what that means in reality is that if you impact, uh, look at the impact of a product across the value chain from raw materials to uh, distribution to production to use, 
Um, and you also look at the various methods, um, how these phases of your product creation and product use are impacting uh, the impact, environmental impact categories, global warming, acidification, eutrophication, they're all mentioned here. Uh, then you have a complete view of what a product actually has impacts on the, 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 the environmental, uh, uh, let's say, categories. Um, I realize that these categories might not be that clear for all of you. Of course, global warming is the topic of today. But of course, um, the, uh, who, whoever has been around in the 80s, uh, sour rain was the big topic. So acidification has all to do with, with all that. Eutrophication has to do with the quality of water. Of course, we want to make sure that we do not pollute water sources as part of the creation of a product. Natural resource depletion speaks for itself, solid waste as well, as well as ecological toxicity. We don't want to, uh, let's say, uh, influence the uh, human or um, uh, plant and animal-based uh, um, uh, atmospheres with toxic products. Ozone depletion is a topic that is always an important um, uh, area. Smoke formation, indoor air quality has very much to do with the inside environment but really important for people, of course, and embodied energy where uh, you talk about uh, the impact factors. So it is really a holistic perspective. Um, and um, well, what is considered is a very brief overview how we look upon it from Forbo. Eh? We have a Forbo uh, a situation where we do pre-processing and pre-processing in our world today is that we extract raw materials from the environment. And of course, in this case, as an example, we do uh, mill uh, limestone into flour, which is an additive into our floor covering. Of course, you need to add that part of your LCA to understand what impact this has from an energy and all these categories that you saw before. For raw materials, it is uh, everything related to getting the raw materials to our manufacturing plants. Um, and uh, of course, making sure that you process them in a proper way. And of course, the impact of that is also measured. When it comes to production, where the products, of course, being uh, all the raw materials come together, um, there are uh, many different inputs and outputs that are being considered and calculated as part of the LC. So it's about energy consumption, raw materials, mass of the product, production steps, packaging, but also when it comes to the output of the pro uh, production process, we talk about waste, emissions, and recycling. So in other words, it's a real holistic perspective. Um, when the product is finished, we ship it somewhere. It can be by train, it can be a ship or a truck. And of course that uses fuel and uh, uses um, uh, distances to cover, um, both on inland or electric or diesel and all these things are being considered. Um, in the phase where our users get involved. So when we talk about our customers, inst installers, but also the users, um, we uh, also attribute or allocate uh, what the impacts on the environmental categories are on uh, utilization topics like installation. Uh, the adhesive has a role to play if there is, of course, an adhesive involved. Um, but also cleaning and maintenance is an important topic to factor in where water use, detergent and electricity are all factors that can have an influence on your LCA performance. And last but not least, the recycling and disposal, of course, has to do with what you do with the end of life situation. If there are uh, situations and scenarios where uh, you remove a floor, of course, with a machine, electricity is, an, is something that you are using. Uh, and that is, is impacting the environment. Um, but also in uh, disposal of the product, incineration, landfill and recycling, are all options that you need to create scenarios with to ensure that you have the full picture. But that all that, of course, makes uh, a pretty complex situation. If we talk about foremost perspective, there's many other manufacturers of floor coverings that, of course, do it in somewhat of a different way. Um, so it's a challenge to do comparison from one product to the other. But it's definitely not impossible. Um, and there are some variables that determine the LCA outcome. The, you saw in the previous presentation from Amanda, there are standards, there are ISO standards and there are PCR, which are the product category rule. 
but the very first variable you can ask yourself as a uh, let's say um, e evaluator of products uh, how do i select a green product is first ask yourself a question uh, what is the um, uh, variable uh, in time in time scope uh, there are lcas where uh, you can um, let's say declare products from cradle to gate uh, which is ju just the three stages of the production process uh, you can also uh, review from gate to user. So the phase where, of course, the use phase uh, is a very lengthy process that has a particular input uh, impact on the environment. Recycling and disposal, end of life is, of course, the, uh, the last phase. But when we talk about the full process from raw materials to the end of life, um, the cradle to cradle, call, uh, let's say, approach is, uh, of course, an important uh, scope for the whole of the LCA. In all our LCAs and most LCAs, cradle to cradle are, of course, uh, principles are utilized for um, uh, assessing uh, the impact on the environment. There's another variable, and uh, the other variable has to do with what is stated here, um, which is about uh, scenarios and boundaries. Um, in every LCA, and that's written down in an EP, an environmental product declaration. Um, there are uh, so-called um, units and scenarios covered. Um, in this case, you can clearly see this is a, a print from a um, LCA of linoleum, um, uh, where you can clearly see that the declared unit is one square meter in this case, where there's a particular weight to the product and a particular conversion factor in kilos. And that is, let's say, the input in doing the calculations, but there's more to it. The other variable has to do with transport distance. Uh, when you can, when you're making an LCA, the transport distance is declared by the manufacturer of a product. So in this case, the average distance that is calculated with is 2000 kilometers in this case, with a capacity of the truck or the load of 85%. Um, LCA producers can play with this number. So, of course, it's a variable that you need to be aware of. Another variable has to do with material loss. Um, in this case, there is 6% installation waste being used. Um, and um, there is um, um, also an auxiliary product, and as an adhesive in this case, also being considered as part of this LCA, which is in this case an adhesive on the back of the floor. Um, in maintenance, there are also assumptions made. So there is a particular water consumption, there's an electricity consumption and a maintenance cycle. And um, that means uh, even for detergent, there is a consideration of how much is being used per year to uh, assess what is the impact. Uh, last but not least is the end of life. In this case, there is uh, three scenarios, scenario one, two, and three, energy recovery, which means there is a scenario where uh, it is incinerated, which means it generates energy again, landfill and recycling. So all these components are variables that are, if you start comparing, need also to be compared before you get to the outcome of an LCA. Uh, last but not least is surface life. Um, the surface life and this particular in this case, you can see the, the, the pre-description of the uh, EPD in the L, that uh, the surface life is mentioned as one year. In most EPDs, most LCAs, it is set to one year because of the, the statement made here, that's the life, the surface lifetime of floor covering for a certain application on the floor is too widespread given common number. So often it is just one year. However, there is a very, very important variable for as well, once you have considered all the variables, there is, of course, the question, what do you think is more important? And because at the end, uh, it all has weights in these modelings. But if global warming for you is the most important topic, that's the topic you need to look for and uh, assess whether the variations that are being used are sufficiently, uh, let's say, uh, addressed. Uh, if I take global warming in the example here, for example, um, the, uh, I will elaborate that in the next slide, but LCA is therefore for many manufacturers a, uh, a utilization to 
uh, well, improve their performance on uh, LCA. Once you have set them right, then um, we have the um, the uh, um, uh, sixty eight percent decrease uh, realization in two thousand four in the period two thousand four to two twenty. So in principle, that means that uh, LCA is a very handy method. But for users, um, so customers and end users, it is important to know that LCA methods cannot by default be compared. And there are differences, as I already mentioned, in the four different ways of looking at it. Um, but the environmental product declarations is always a good way to look at LCA data. And that is what Amanda already explained. In, at Forba, we have uh, EPDs that show all the product groups um, uh, in, uh, in our website uh, that are independently reviewed because that's the last step to make it real and accurate that it's also reviewed by a third party. So it's not a self-declared statement because the checks of course need to be made to make sure that the scope setting descriptions and boundaries are all set properly. Uh, an LCA looks like this. This is, oh, sorry, an EPD looks like this. There are many categories. You can see a full description of everything we've covered here. So um, the life cycle uh, data, but also even what is the recycled content, what are the cutoffs, all those points are mentioned in there. So how do you compare EPDs? Um, well, comparison is, in our case, relatively easy. As long as you make sure that the standardization methods here are similar, uh, you can start comparing also based on the scenarios being used. So Forbo uses uh, the standards that are being used by the European Resil Resilient Manufacturers Institute, which is what Willem already mentioned. It's the institute that drives uh, the standardization across the industry. And on their website, they have an EPD calculator. And what is handy with that calculator is that for every product category, a customer can download a PDF of an EPD, and that looks like this. So this is the EPD I've been using before in my presentation, where clearly it is stated for the whole of the category in this case, and this is uh, the category plain and decorative linoleum as an example, but it's for every different resilient category where the standardization has been done for the whole of the category for all the manufacturers in Europe. And um, the detail is really um, uh, uh, in that document in much more levels than uh, you can see uh, in the presentation. And I don't wanna cover it all, but just giving you an idea that the various stages of production is what you see here, which is coded by the names of A23, uh, A4 to all the way to the end of life. And the impact categories are written on the vertical side. And you can see what the impacts are on in this case, global warming potential. So uh, where um, the statement is in this case that the category of linoleum uh, in the production, uh, in the sourcing to production phase generates 2.78 global warming potential. So how do you then compare? Uh, this is an EPD of Forbo, which has exactly the same table as you saw in the previous slide. Here also uh, horizontally, all the impacts uh, all the phases in production and use, and on the vertical side, the impact categories. And here you can see again, the global warming potential of this individual product. What is interesting about marmolium is that marmolium is made of 97% natural raw materials, which means that the product actually generates uh, um, um, in its LCA, it actually absorbs CO2, or uh, global warming uh, potential. So that means it has a minus 4.2 grams, in this case, per square meter uh, of CO2 performance. And if you start comparing it, comparing is just laying the two layers on top of each other. This is the industry standard. This, the top one is the Forbo standard, where you, the individual product, you can assess it against the category groups, which is from the industry. And the industry is declared at 2.78, as mentioned, but the individual product here has a much lower score as a consequence to the, to the regular uh, industry. So you can do that for every part in the whole of the uh, LCA. Another one is, for example, 
um, uh, the, um, the last phase in the end of life. Um, the scenarios are more or less the same. So there's high, high, and the index is more or less the same as well. So the scoring is the same as well. So these are fully compatible because what I did before I went into here with that individual product, I looked at four different variables to see if there's any differences and there were not. So the future of EPD and LCA yeah, so is, is really um, about uh, making selections, making customers uh, enable them to make uh, the right uh, decisions based on LCA. And uh, what is the future on top of it is that LCA um, and EPDs, uh, in, that's the, the way how it's reported to the outer world, uh, have of course all these impact categories. In the future, ecotoxicity and human toxicity will also be prepared in future EPDs. At Forbo today, all the EPDs already have these um, eco and human toxicity declarations included, which of course is a, a, well an extra guarantee that uh, you're ready for the future in that sense. So where can you find them? In any of the download centers uh, related to the products that are on offer. Um, this is not only at Forbo, it is at, the, at most of the suppliers in the, in the flooring market. Um, and I uh, uh, well, would invite you to look at an EPD, download it and uh, see if you can actually get, uh, get some sense out of it based on the presentation I just gave. There's another place which was already uh, mentioned by Amanda, which is the, let's say, the place where more much more products than just for flooring products are being presented, which is the uh, spot place of UL, where all the products can be found as well that have been individually uh, and independently reviewed uh, uh, by, uh, by UL in this case. Um, this is my last slide. The, uh, what I really wanted to leave behind is that product comparison is not easy, but when you know what to look for, the four variables, as I mentioned, are uh, are easier to uh, to make comparison. It is uh, still a world that is, of course, uh, requiring people to really pay attention. At the end, I think it is also really important to state that uh, there are four disciplines of any company that besides LCA and EPD disclosure, uh, it is all to do with reduce, reuse, recycle and renewable. As long as you use these uh, principles in your environmental policy, your a LCA and EPD results will show better and better over time. And therefore the LCA is a very excellent tool for our customers, but also for ourselves to improve over time and years and years to come. Thank you very much, Edo. Uh, we are now being joined by both Edo and Amanda for some questions. I would just like to ask Edo, you gave the example for linoleum, but within Forbo, there are independent uh, third-party certified EPDs for all our product collections. Is that correct? That's correct indeed. We have uh, in, at Forbo 47 EPDs at the moment being published for every category um, and also independently verified, in this case by UL. Um, and they can all be downloaded uh, to vinyl and linoleum, textile and flow text products. Okay. Um, Amando, this whole process of uh, creating an EPD, how long does that take? Yeah, so one, one key thing to point out is that an LCA does need to be done before an EPD can be verified. And so um, sometimes customers will come to us before they have an LCA, sometimes they're already will have the LCA. So the LCA itself, I think typically will take about three to six months. Um, if you've never gone through that process before, it can easily be on the longer end of that. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's done typically with the external practitioner or something you may do in house. The actual EPD verification process, that can be um, probably typically a couple months, but it can vary quite a bit depending on um, how many EPDs that you, you have, how many issues that need to be corrected as part of that process. Um, it could be uh, how quickly it takes to actually update the EPDs. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could take as little as two weeks. Um, it could take a few months, it just, just depends on the situation. 
Okay. And um, what you see nowadays is that there are more and more, let's say, uh, building certifications like LEED and BREEAM and the well building standard. Do those also make use of EPDs to verify the quality of a product? Amanda? Yeah, so so yeah, they'll you can get lead points or any of those building rating systems will typically give you points if you yes. uh, use products that have an EPD um, just established. Just simply by having an EPD, you can get points towards towards a building rating system. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a question here from uh, the audience saying, your EPD library, is that an independent library? Do you publish everything you have investigated, no matter if the company asking you to do the certification likes the outcome or not? Or are you dependent upon the consent of the manufacturer for publication? Um, well, if we've certified the EPD, so the EPD does need to meet the criteria, right, before mm -hmm. it can be on the database. Yes. Um, so it obviously needs to be verified, um, and then we publish it. I don't think we've, you know, it's an interesting question. We, we've published all of the EPDs that have okay. come through to us. I don't think we've had the situation where somebody's asked we don't publish it or <clears throat> even in that situation. Okay. Yeah. So you did not send anyone back to do more homework and come back in six months? Right. No, no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the main purpose is to have it published. Simply by having an EPD, you're taking a step in the right direction of mm -hmm. saying, Here, yep. here's the environmental impacts of our product. And then yep. from there, you can potentially lower what you have and make it better. Um, but I think people see it as, a, as an important step of just having it, right? Getting it out there. Okay. Edo, um, it's, it's, it's obvious huh? the, 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 the topic is quite technical. It is also quite a difficult topic to get a grasp to. Um, there are a lot of different uh, variables where you can actually uh, have an influence. Um, I also see companies who do it easy. They, they just say, we are cradle to cradle certified. Now, you also used the phrase cradle to cradle. What is the difference between a cradle to cradle certification and cradle to cradle when we read about it in an EPD? Well, in principle, the, uh, the, the, the starting with the, with the, uh, the label of, uh, of, uh, of cradle to cradle, that is, uh, of course, a system where you can essentially uh, uh, go through a program of certification and get, a, uh, get you could say, certified by, uh, by a company that, uh, well, uh, exists because of um, uh, disclosing, uh, let's say, labels. Uh, so you can go for uh, uh, silver or gold and, uh, and, and really levels. And it's actually meant to, uh, of course, do the same. They also do an assessment on cradle to cradle, um, but it's actually to helping the customers to make it a bit simpler. Uh, uh, so if you just have a label, then of course that label should be uh, sufficiently. Uh, I think what uh, the intention of the LCA with an independently uh, verified EPD is, is that you actually give full disclosure of everything that you have to show for uh, on every detail you want. Uh, at the end, it's not about a label, but it's, uh, it's uh, making clear how you think can compare things, first of all, because uh, it's hard to compare uh, uh, a certificate versus uh, an EPD, that's impossible. Um, uh, so using the industrial standards and let's say the industrial methods to compare products with the others uh, are actually the way to go and making it simpler to our uh, to our outer world. On top of it, it's just spending money for something where we already have a standard in our industry. So there's no reason for us at least to go that route. Okay, good. Um, now, there's, there's a question which I don't know if I posed it to Amanda or to Ada, but if I look at the future of EPDs and if I look at the current environment where we have the Paris Climate Agreement, where we have the Green Deal in Europe, where we have the focus on recycled content in products, where we have the focus on CO2 emissions, where we are even asking manufacturers to take back their cutting waste and to take back their used flooring, this extended producer responsibility. Um, is there a chance that EPDs will change, that these 
uh, aspects will gain a heavier weight, Amanda. Is that is that the case? Are you seeing EPDs in the future being more in line with current political requirements? You know, I, I don't know if this answers the question directly, but when you were talking about it, I was thinking how right now the EPD space is, is pretty well established for mm -hmm. construction market, um, especially in Europe, you see it in the US as well. And one of the trends we're seeing is more and more um, trade associations and groups outside of that construction marketing are getting interested in the creation of VPDs. And so um, more and more product types that we you know, weren't seeing before are now starting to take interest in it because of this changing landscape that you're talking about. Yeah. Um, although climate numbers like the, the greenhouse gas potential, I think that's where a lot of times people are going straight to that that number and some might be looking for carbon footprints, but yeah, I think I think there's a lot of potential for growth in EPDs beyond just um, beyond just the building construction market that we've seen pretty established so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a little bit also what Edo mentioned in his presentation. Eh? What do you consider important for your building, for your environment? Clean water, clean air, uh, both in equal numbers. What aspects are you actually picking out of that LCA overview? Okay, um, it's five o'clock. We've come to the end of this presentation. I have no more questions on my iPad. Um, I'm actually also done with my questions. I would like to thank both of you very much for um, a topic which is not about color and design, which is not about trends in floor covering, but is the very essence of what it is that we deliver to our customer. And I think um, it's, um, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a rather tough hour, but it's very good to see how thoroughly um, we as a company, and we are not alone in that, are actually doing our work to offering you the product that we promised that we are going to make for you. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for getting up a little bit early, Amanda. Thank you all listeners to the program of today and hope to see you again in the next seminar, which will be after the summer months. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.